We wanted to create a series of tutorials about Circuits 1, basically go over Circuits 1 from the beginning to the end. So even if we don't get into the crazy math that you're going to run into into your college courses or your high school courses, you'll at least understand the concepts. And we will do some math, but I don't. I think we're going to focus more on making it so you can intuitively understand. So when you look at a circuit, you kind of have a good feel for what it's going to be versus how do I crunch the numbers on this one. So with that, I would first like to jump into, before we get into anything, some of the basic terms that I hear and some of the ways that those terms are misused and um, confused all of the time. So in circuits, you're going to hear current and voltage a lot, and those are confused all the time. And they're very, very different. They're related, but they're very, very different. So with current and voltage, voltage is the desire for electrons to move from one place to another. It's a voltage potential. It's the potential energy difference between two different spots. The way I like to think of it and the way you'll hear many people discuss it is using the water analogy. And that's sort of like if you have water up here and water down here, the water up here wants to flow down here. But if you have like a cup of water up here and it's not flowing down here, you don't have any flow, but it's still at that higher potential. So that's voltage in terms of that desire, that potential for this to move down to here. Now current, using that water analogy, would be if I were to tip the glass in that flow of water, that flow of electrons, would be that movement of electrons, and that would be current. Now when you have a circuit, you have a voltage across something, and you have a current through things, and that's because you have that potential across something saying, I want to have a flow there, but not necessarily have that flow, whereas the current is the actual flow through that circuit element. Just like with the cup of water, having a cup of water up here, you have that voltage potential, but it's not until you turn it that you actually have the flow. And I don't know why it's such a pet peeve for me, but it drives me crazy to hear somebody say, volts through something. Yeah, that's got 10 volts through it. Oh, it doesn't have 10 volts through it. It has 10 volts across it. It might have 10 milliamps through it, but it has 10 volts across it. Now, one quick thing, and this is something you don't get an intuitive feel of in most circuits, but usually bigger numbers in amps are more impressive than bigger numbers in volts. So I was actually doing an electromagnet project with my daughter since all the schools are closed right now. And I put my leads on this thing and it had about three amps going through it. And that was enough for my leads to start melting again. And I had to pull it and pull the lead, the melted wire out, or excuse me, the wire out of the melted plastic. And that was only three amps. Where those same leads I can put across 120 volts and not have any problems with that. So that's something you'll hear. The high power lines, those are thousands and tens of thousands of volts. Whereas if I were to hear something had tens of thousands of amps, I would be terrified out of my mind because I usually only deal with stuff that has less than an amp. Other people, they can deal with it in power grid distribution, all that sort of stuff. But for most projects you're dealing with, if you're seeing anything over a couple of amps, that's a really big number. Whereas you can get into the 100 volts without breaking too much of a sweat. So that's just something, again, when you're working on stuff in circuits, they don't really care. They're just going to make the math whatever makes sense and what is ever either easy or hard. But when in real life, if you're dealing especially with embedded systems and electronics, small numbers for current are more normal in the milliamps or microamps versus the amps or tens or hundreds of amps. With that out of the way, let's jump into the difference between power and energy. And first, let's just talk about what power is. So when I was talking about taking that glass and pouring it, there's a certain amount of power. If we had a paddle wheel here and we were to pour the water and maybe had the paddle wheel down here, that water would pick up velocity and be able to spin the wheel. And that combination of both the potential and the flow is the power that turns that wheel. And it's also something where if you notice, uh, if you take a glass up here and there's no flow, there's no power because it's just sitting up there. So that is a zero power situation. Whereas if I were to take a glass of water and gently spill it across this table, there would also be no power, basically no power because there is no voltage. You're getting that flow across here, but there's no way to really turn a turbine or turn any sort of wheel off of that. And so power is a factor of both voltage and flow current to be able to do work with that power. So power and energy are frequently used interchangeably, but that is totally incorrect. Power is a function of energy 
over time, usually energy per second. So you can get something that has a lot of power at that one moment, but there's not a huge amount of overall energy, or you can have something that has a huge amount of overall energy, but isn't able to actually produce much power. And 95% of what you do in circuits is going to be power, and that's really all you're going to worry about. But if you start working with things like capacitors, that's where the difference makes a difference. Because capacitors, they don't hold very much energy. You can't get much out of them, but they can release current incredibly fast, much faster than a battery. So you can say that a capacitor has an incredibly high power density because it can produce a ton of energy in a very short period of time compared to a battery, which can produce only a fraction of, a fraction of the amount of energy in that same period of time, but it can sustain it for much, much longer. And so it has a much higher energy density because you can get overall much more work done with the battery than with the capacitor, even though you can't get as much out at the same time. So those are the basic four things that you need to worry about. And really of these four, the two most important things in the next classes and the next lessons are going to be voltage and current. The vast majority of your circuit analysis is going to be to solve for voltage across something or current through something. That is going to be 95% of what you're doing over the next couple of months. So make sure that you know what those are and the difference between them, and you should be good to go. I hope that was helpful. I hope that set a foundation that you enjoyed this enough that you'll come and join us for the rest of this basic circuits classes and basic circuits tutorials. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. I think we're gonna learn a ton of stuff. As always, we put a written tutorial up on circuitbread.com, link in the description down below, and that gives a different perspective, a different uh, view of things, and also explains a couple things more in depth, things that we aren't able to do in the video. So I definitely recommend going to check that out. As it is, Hope you enjoyed this and we will catch you in the next one.